Good evening. Good evening. Welcome, everyone. I want to say thank you to the Emmanuel and Atonement Youth Group. Let's give them a hand for the wonderful supper. It was delicious, and thank you to all the parents and all the kids helping. I ate so much that I'm, I'm, I'm ready for a nap, so <laughs> might let you do this tonight. <laughs> But thank you guys, thank you, and thank you for coming to support our youth group. Um, that's great. Just a, rem um, a little announcement, a little advertisement plug. Next Tuesday, our men's ministry here at Atonement is having their annual, we call it the Don Tomes Pancake Supper. So we are excited to get back up and running. And so Tuesday, starting at, or starting at 4.30 to 7, come and have pancakes. So pancakes and sausage and um, the men serve. So you're welcome for that. One last announcement. There's a, a wonderful brochure on our table that we're having a special offering for the Eastern European crisis. Money is going to Ukraine and um, here locally the orphan Green Train has some needs, some things they are looking for that will be airlifted. Um, they're collecting until April 18th. So if you would like to have more details and a list, this is on the small table uh, with the black tablecloth. So this is something really cool locally that we can um, help support that um, terrible situation. So lift that up. Any announcements do you have from your church? Hello? Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> um, next week, um, aton or Atonement, you will get be served by Emmanuel. We are providing um, the meal next week. But we would ask, if we look confused in your kitchen, please give us a hand because <laughs> you know how that will go. But it will be soup and sandwiches. It will be chicken or homemade tomato and chicken wild rice. So. Well, we look forward to being served yes. and we will help whatever you need so you're welcome to our kitchen wonderful so. oh and uh, um emmanuel members we need four pans of bars and i know of two of them i for sure so if you could talk amongst yourselves thanks <laughs> perfect i believe that's all the announcements lucinda uh, pastor lucinda if you can call us into worship yes let us begin and i would invite everyone to um Close their eyes and take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth and let the cares of the day be handed over to our good and gracious God. May you be able to open yourselves to the Holy Spirit's presence and talking to you as we hear, see, 
and join together in the word this evening. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Okay, let us begin with our opening hymn, our entrance hymn, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace can be found on the screen or verses 1 and 4 on number 779 in your hymnal. Amazing Grace. Perfect hymn because tonight where the miracle is Jesus heals a man born blind. So I once was blind, blind but now I see. So, so, and why don't we ask everybody to stand? Stand. Could we give Julie a hand for playing for us these last days? <laughs> Just want to appreciate this on piano day. I think it, this is actually the official piano day, if anybody wants to know that. So um, thank you, Julie. You may be seated as we have a time of confession and forgiveness in this season of Lent. We come together in the name of God who makes a way in the wilderness walks with us, and guides us in our pilgrimage. Amen. We take a moment of silence to talk to God in our heart, confess our sins. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from you. We have not trusted your promises, we have ignored your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize you in our midst. Have mercy on us, forgive us, and turn us again to you. Teach us to follow in your ways. Assure us again of your love, and help us to teach our neighbor. Amen. Beloved in Christ, the word draws near to you, and all who call out to God shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again and again and gathers you under wings of love. In Jesus' name, your sins are all forgiven. God journeys with you and teaches you how to live in love. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, Lord we, come we come together, together to hear, hear, see, and join in your word. Feed us, heal us, us and, and lift us as we open our eyes and ears and minds to your, to your miracles around us. In Jesus' name we pray. pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, we hear God's word. Listen for the Holy Spirit if there's a phrase or word that catches you as we hear. And you've got your sheet where you can write if something catches you. I read, today I'm going to read from the message, a contemporary Bible, starting on the Gospel of John, the ninth chapter. 
Walking down the street, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, causing him to be born blind? Jesus said, you are asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There is no such cause and effect here. Look instead for what God can do. We need to be energetically at work for the one who sent me here, working while the sun shines. When night falls, the workday is over. For as long as I am in the world, Jesus says, there is plenty of light. I am the world's light. Jesus said this and then spit in the dust, made a clay paste with the saliva, rubbed the paste on the blind man's eyes, and said, Go wash at the, po the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. The man went and washed, and he saw. Soon the town, the town was buzzing, his relatives and those who year after year had seen him as a blind man begging were saying, why, isn't this the man we knew who sat here and begged? And others said, it's him all right. But others objected, it's not the same man at all. It looks just like him. And he said, it's me, it's me, it's the very one. They said, how did your eyes get opened? A man named Jesus made a paste and rubbed it on my eyes and told me, go wash in Siloam and go to Siloam and wash. I did what he said. When I washed, I saw. So where is he? I don't know. They marched the man to the Pharisees. This day when Jesus made the paste and healed his blindness was the Sabbath. The Pharisees grilled him again on how he had come to see. He said, he put clay paste on my eyes and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, obviously this man can't come from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. Others countered, how can a bad man do mir the miraculous? God revealing things like this. There was a split in their ranks. They came back at the blind man. You're the expert. He opened your eyes. What do you say about him? The blind man said, the man that was blind said, he is a prophet. The Jews didn't believe it, didn't believe the man was blind to begin with. So they called the parents of the man now bright eyed with sight. They asked them, is this your son, the one you say was born blind? So how is it that now he sees? His parents said, we know his, he is our son, and we know that he was born blind, but we don't know how he came to see, having a clue about who opened his eyes. Why don't you ask him? He's a grown man, and he can speak for himself. His parents were talking like this because they were intimidated by the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who took a stand that this was the Messiah would be kicked out of the meeting place. That's why his parents said, ask him, he's a grown man. They called the man back a second time, the man who had been blind, and told him, give credit to God, we know this man is an imposter. He replied, I know nothing about that one way or the other, but I know one thing for sure, I was blind, now I see. They said, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I've told you over and over and you haven't listened. Why do you want to hear it again? Are you so eager to become his disciples? With that, they jumped all over him. You might be a disciple of that man, but we're disciples of Moses. We know for sure that God spoke to Moses, but we have no idea where this man even comes from. The man replied, this is amazing. You claim to know nothing about him, but the fact is he opened my eyes. It's well known that God isn't at the beck and call of sinners 
but listens carefully to anyone who lives in reverence and does his will. That someone opened the eyes of a man born blind has never been heard of, ever. If this man didn't come from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. They said, you're nothing but dirt. How dare you take that tone with us? Then they threw him out in the street. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out and went and found him. He asked him, do you believe in the Son of Man? The man said, point him out to me, sir, so that I can believe in him. And Jesus said, you're looking right at him. Don't you recognize my voice? Master, I believe, the man said, and worshipped him. Jesus then said, I came into the world to bring everything into the clear light of day, making all the distinctions clear, so that those who have never seen will see, and those who have made a great pretense of seeing will be exposed as blind. Some Pharisees overheard him and said, does that mean you're calling us blind? Jesus said, if you were really blind, you would be blameless. But since you claim to see everything so well, you're accountable for every fault and failure. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So think about what you've heard in that, in that gospel lesson about the man born blind, and I'm going to read to you from the artist's reflection for tonight's painting. Um, this one starts with some of the clearest people in the foreground. This painting begins with the image of various facial expressions, emotions, and body postures of the Pharisees, indicating that their academic and accusing contemplation in the law. Who was at fault for this man's condition? Someone has to be responsible. Their debate goes on and the man appears as a dark silhouette. Back and top lighting will illuminate his location as the painting process progresses. The dark, undefined silhouette represents the blind man. It's also intended to symbolize his physical blindness, contrasting with the spiritual blindness and clarity of the Pharisees in the foreground. The color of the blind man and his surroundings are cool blues and grays, while the colors in the foregrounds are warm and more aggressive. Thick brown paint is used as the mud when Jesus washes his eyes. And then this is diluted with water and light blue paint, and it runs down with each addition of the mix. A simple scrubbing of this area with a rag brings light into the face of the man and indicates that he can see. His arm, his, his left arm repositions, emphasizing his healing, and that has been given to him by Jesus. I take note, the second Pharisee from the left, as the progression takes place, an accusing hand or finger appears, pointing directly at the blind man. The blind man is to blame. He is the problem, according to the Pharisees. The color of the garments of the Pharisees increase in vibrancy as they piously seek to make their conclusions. They are brighter in their certainty, but around them it gets darker. The figure of Jesus is painted facing the blind man with sight. Both arms are raised, and of course, light streams from above onto the blind man and Jesus, while the Pharisees remain in the dark. This reversal is to reveal the reversal in the story. The blind can see, and those who, they, who say they can see remain blind. With that, let us see and hear Jesus heals the man born blind from John 9, 1 through 41. So watch those color changes. Watch the light, the dark and the light. Watch the hand movements. Um, it's fascinating to see that. If I told you my name, you would not recognize it. I'm only known as the man born blind in the Bible. And that's how most people refer to me on the street. 
You have to realize that for me, to be born blind meant one of two things. Either it was because of something I did, some sin that I committed in my mother's womb, or punishment for something that my father or his father or any of the fathers in this family line had done. To be blind meant I was an outcast. The only life open to me was the life of a beggar, and it didn't take long to realize how people felt about beggars. The pity, the disdain, the mockery, taunting all the time until soon I began to realize that I was worse than useless because I was a burden upon everyone around me. There was no hope, none at all. The only hope for me and any of us who were blind was a miracle of God, and that didn't seem very likely. Yet, this is exactly where my story begins. Everyone had heard of this man, Jesus. Some said he was a great teacher. Some spoke of his compassion like no other man had. Others said, stay away from him. He's a heretic, a blasphemer. Don't be seen with him, whatever you do. All of a sudden, though, there he was. Oh, I couldn't see him, at least not yet. I was blind, but I heard the people talking. The crowds pressing in, I knew he was approaching, approaching me, at least I thought so. Then I heard those disciples ask that question that I had heard so many times before. Who sinned, they said, this man or his parents since he was born blind? I despised that question. It heaped shame upon shame on me. It was a question that haunted me every day of my life. Why? Why was I born blind? What could I have done in my mother's womb that was so terrible? Or if my father sinned, why would I have to be punished for that? But then I heard something new, something different. Jesus answered and he said, Neither, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but he was born blind in order that the work of God might be made visible in him. I didn't know what he was talking about. And then he said something that would make sense in a moment. He said, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. What a glorious word this was, light. I had heard people talk about light. I had felt the warmth of the sun on a hot day but light, what was light? Would I ever know? I was told later that this Jesus of Nazareth came close to me, spit on the ground, reached down and made mud with his spit and the dust. He pressed it into my eyes. I was afraid, not sure what he was doing. Maybe I should get up and run away, I remember thinking. And he said to me, go and wash in the pool of Siloam just a little pool of water outside your present wall of Jerusalem now. 
Some people took me by the hand and guided me to the pool. I leaned down, washed the mud from my eyes, and for the first time, my eyes were open. I could see, I could see, I could actually see light poured in. I looked at the sky and I saw what others had told me was blue. I could see colors, flowers, people, and their faces. That day, I felt like I knew what it was like to be born. For the first time in my life, I could see. I was blind, but now, because of this Jesus, I could see. You would think that others would have rejoiced in my good fortune, but the Pharisees wanted to dismiss the whole thing, disregard me even further, determined to prove that this did not happen. They tried to get me to admit that this Jesus of Nazareth was a sinner, that I should instead give glory to God. Well, I didn't care if he was a sinner or not. He had opened my eyes. They couldn't take this away from me or change the fact that I had been blind and now, now I could see. You would think, wouldn't you, that others would have been rejoicing for me and with me. Not so. Most turned away from me, even my own parents, afraid to speak of what Jesus had done, protecting themselves so they would not be put out of the synagogue, especially since my healing took place on the Sabbath. They did not stand by me. Let him answer for himself. He is of age, they said. Don't ask us. Everyone seemed to be against me. Taunting, heckling, accusing, until I finally had had enough. I looked at them and said, why are you so interested in this Jesus of Nazareth? Would you like to become his disciple too? And I pressed them even further. What an extraordinary thing that this man is able to open the eyes of the blind, something that only God can do, and you who are the religious leaders know nothing about him. Isn't that amazing? This threw them into a rage, and they threw me out of the synagogue for life. It didn't matter because Jesus had healed me and I would not betray him now. It was at this point, my lowest point, that Jesus came back to me. He looked at me and he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And I said, Lord, who is he? Tell me and I will believe. Then he said to me, You have seen him. The one who is speaking to you is he.
And I fell down on my knees and said, Lord, I believe. It took me a while, but I realized that my blindness that day had only been partially healed. It would not be until after his resurrection that my eyes would be opened even further. And then I could see that this Jesus was not just for me or just the religious people or just a few, but had come for all, for you. This has made all the difference in my life. I was blind and now I can see. gets more powerful. What did you guys see? What grabbed your attention? Take a few moments and just um, talk with one another about what your favorite part was. My favorite part was when his arms went up at the end. They had been down and his arms went up and the light streaming down. So, um, just take a few moments and talk with each other or turn around and join a, a group um, behind you and then we'll have a time of sharing. What phrases or images caught your eye? Where did you see yourself? What does this story mean for you? And Lucinda and I have a couple other questions that we'll ask after you talk about those. Anybody have anything specific that they noticed that they'd like to share? I like the water. That was my big one, watching the water. And I heard the water drip this time. <laughs> when you sit up close, you hear things. I heard, the, I heard some drops of water, and it reminded me of baptism, baptism? and cleansing and healing. I am... Um, the color changes. The colors, the neutrals to the colors, and, and what color is it when the miracle happens? What generally, what, what is the color all the time with the miracle? The white. White light. White. Yep. White light. Like light. Oh. A couple other questions. Like, where have you seen light in the darkness? Where have you seen where have light? Where have you seen light in the darkness? In the darkness. And darkness can be in a lot of forms. Darkness in our world, darkness, you know, with all the things that have been happening. I noticed today, have you noticed that when we started meeting four weeks ago, it was dark outside, and tonight it's very bright in here, and I was like, all of a sudden, like, there must have been a switch outside, and all of a sudden I went, oh, it's really bright in here. <laughs> I don't know what it was. So. It's light. 
Yeah. And what does that light feel like compared to the darkness? Darkness and light. Yeah, blinded. Yeah, Mr. Rogers always look for the helper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Looking for the light. Um, and I think I think it was Hell Door says there's joy. There's always joy, even in the darkness. Somebody just needs to remember to turn on the light. So Elvis Dumbledore, if you're a Harry Potter fan. <laughs> I think it, Helen Keller used to say, I think it was Helen Keller said, sometimes it has to get really dark before you see the light. And I, you know, sometimes you think about the sky at night and it can be really dark and then all of a sudden the little twinkling lights come on. Um, I have a question for you and you can choose to share if you'd like. I will be a little vulnerable, but we were talking about, in this he says, you think they would have been happy for me, right? He says, you think they would have been happy for me. And so... We were talking about this, and I will say, like, when you're, uh, when sometimes we'll have a meeting of other pastors, and it's really easy to get together sometimes and talk about things that aren't working, and, you know, we, misery loves company, you know, and then someone will say something about that's wonderful, that's really going on at their church, and there, every once in a while, you catch yourself say, no, 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 that's so they get more people at their Sunday school than we, and you start to compare yourself to another person's church or another person's job or something. And has it ever been hard for you to celebrate somebody else's joy? That's a tough one. <laughs> but we need to celebrate other people's joy. And this poor blind man, nobody was celebrating except him. He's like, I can see and I can't even imagine what struck me today is, what did that look like? You know, all he, he saw nothing, nothing blank. And then all of a sudden, he could see. And I think about, too, the, the, the pain of that. Um, that's a transition. Like The pain of it. it can be, we've all had that moment where someone turns on a light when you're in a dark room and it hurts. Imagine your eyes being open and your, your brain has never comprehended what your eyes are doing, how painful that must have been in that process. And nobody's happy for you. Nobody's helping you out. No one's able to say, look, that's a tree. I mean, <laughs> yep. everything had to have been brand new. Because um, even his parents, his parents weren't parents happy. Were, yeah. You know, Pharisees weren't happy. Nobody was happy for him except for him. And so I can only imagine he's just like wanting to jump for joy and just like nobody's, what's happening here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, his identity changed. What was that? He can learn and do things. He can learn mm -hmm. and do things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But with his identity changing, people have always it, been able to pity yeah. him. Right? You know what I mean? There's a certain amount of, I think someone's like, at least I'm not him. That, you know what I mean? We kind of get to always say, well, at least I'm not him. Yeah. Um, I always joke about that with, um, I always talk about that with, you know, when we're talking about sin, that we always play the card, well, at least I'm not Hitler. <laughs> card, you know, you can compare yourself to the worst. So these people could say, you know, well, at least I'm not blind. At least I'm not a beggar. And all of a sudden, he is given completely new freedom and identity. New life. And it's like, now what? How, how, do, how, do, we treat, how do we treat him? How do we act around him? We don't, we don't know what to we do. We don't know. So we're just going to kick him out of the synagogue for the rest of his life. Because then we can pretend he's not there. Any other thoughts? Yep. Amen. Yeah. When we die, we're going to be remembered for what we give away. Amen. Yeah. Anything else? Anything else you saw or you heard or you? I think that people didn't describe the things that they said. Somebody told me that the sky is blue. Sky is blue. Somebody yeah. told me. Yep. So they yeah. had some people that were helping. Some people helping along the way. Yeah. I, I love Pastor Paul's comment at the very end. You know, see, Jesus comes for all of us. 
and for you and you and you and you. I was blind, but now I see. So I encourage you next time you sing that hymn to just think about that a little bit from a different perspective too. And what areas things. of our life are we blind in? Lord, help us to see, help us to open our eyes. Anything else? Okay, they, they didn't the look the particularly <laughs> friendly. <laughs> well, thank you for this wonderful discussion. I can't believe that next Wednesday is going to be our last, our last gathering for these paintings. So, and I'm going to encourage you to do something very, very un Midwestern Lutheran churchgoer. What was amazing to me is uh, the wonderful gift that Michelle and Tegan gave us that we got to sit down. So I sat with my family over there and all of a sudden I was closer to the painting and it was a different perspective and a different angle. And I had seen it from my normal spot um, on Monday and it's completely different when you look at it from a different angle or you're closer to it. And so then tonight I intentionally moved over here so I would look at it from a different place. So I highly encourage you to change your seat you don't sit, have sit to sit someplace else <laughs> and also if you come forward the sound is louder up here than it is in the back because when i got a chance to sit with my husband which i never get to sit with my husband so i was just thrilled you know my husband loves the back and and it's like i can't hear back here <laughs> so yeah. So just change your perspective. If you, you've got one week left to just change your perspective a little bit and see what you see and hear. And, uh, I know. I know. I know. I know. Well, and I look at this too as like someone um, has, someone in our church switched their seat and I didn't realize they'd been in church for two weeks. They just switched their place. Because I know where everybody sits. <laughs> So when Robert Ness switched, it was a tough two. I didn't realize he'd been there for two weeks. Like I was like, "Oh, I missed you." He's like, "I've been here the last two weeks." Oh. Uh huh. Yes. Remember that if you see someone new walking to church and they're very unsure, they're really worried about sitting in somebody else's spot. They really are, and. I've, I've often like it because I know where everybody sits and so if I see somebody new I introduce myself because that's kind of what the pastor does but I also be like oh if you sit in those seats in the middle you won't hit anybody's seat and they're like okay <laughs> just go as we continue on we come to our part of praying this is the time between you and God to come and light a candle you may just remain seated if you wish or you can come forward um, here in the back over here we got four spots and um, talk with God I also wanted to just make note of the beautiful sunflower arrangement up here at the altar this flower arrangement is in memory of um, the funeral this morning for Paul Stallhalt and so we keep Paul's family and friends in our prayers at this time so um, please Come and, Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray.
gracious God, hear the prayers of our hearts that we lift before you. Give us your peace, your comfort, and your joy. And teach us to pray as Jesus taught us. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our offering, um, our offering buckets are in the back, one marked Emmanuel, one marked Atonement. Thank you for your offerings. And our benediction. Receive now the benediction. Please stand. Yeah. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 And let us join together in ascending him. And this is one of my favorites, uh, my favorite evening hymns. So let us join together in singing number, um, number 629 if you want to follow the hymnal. But otherwise, we will sing Abide With Me. in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for coming. We'll see you next week.